lead a discussion here uh, of uh, proteins and how do you think about proteins from the point of view of biomanufacturing in, in a slightly different way than we think about proteins when we're teaching microbiology students or cell molecular biology students about protein structure for the first time. Now, we're going to bring in a lot of those fundamentals and apply them to the biomanufacturing world, uh, but we also are going to think about proteins slightly different as well. So uh, right now, biotech, when you say the biotech industry, right now, uh, with, with few exceptions, and they're spectacular exceptions, a biotech means that you're going to produce pharmaceutically active proteins. That is, you've genetically engineered a cell with a gene of interest, and you've tricked that non-human cell to make a human protein that has some sort of function in the body. And so a good example, this is a uh, $8 billion a year product, a human erythropoietin uh, epogen from <clears throat> Amgen. Um, Amgen uh, produced this uh, interesting story. Uh, the uh, scientific team was given one last chance to uh, clone the gene because it had been so difficult. And on their last chance, they got it. And it turned into an $8 billion a year product. The, the other interesting thing about this is that the cells, uh, the Cho cells that produce it haven't been adapted for uh, suspension culture. And so they're made in spinner flasks, sorry, in roller bottles. And so you just have this warehouse, as far as you can see, with roller bottles. Uh, but uh, it shows the value of, of this. This is used as a treatment to boost red blood cell production in people uh, post chemotherapy and also for renal patients uh, that often have uh, uh, anemia. And uh, what they also say is that that once their anemia is cured, their chronic depression that they've had for a long time has been cured as well because uh, there's a, a mind-body connection. So um, I, I uh, was uh, specializing in nucleic acids in graduate school, and so I was cloning genes and you know talked about uh, uh, DNA and RNA and. But in the end, it's the protein that makes the money. The protein is the product. And then I, I stole a couple of these from Ellen Doherty. Uh, so DNA is the flash, but protein makes the cash. And then uh, my students got into it. They said, DNA is the show, but protein makes the dough. DNA is the bling, but protein is the thing. And so we spent a lot of time uh, talking about <laughs> genetic engineering and ma manipulating the gene. But at the end of the day, uh, the protein is the product. And so in cell molecular biology, we talk about proteins and I talk about the tools of the cell and nucleic acids we spend a lot of time in. Uh, carbohydrates in, in biomanufacturing, we mainly talk about as, car as carbon and energy sources and then lipids are there, but we don't spend much time with them. But uh, proteins, uh, pretty much every protein function can be captured and uh, used as a, as a product. And so uh, just to look at a couple of them, enzymes, biological catalyst, you have tissue plasminogen activator, a uh, thrombolytic, a, an enzyme that digests blood clots, and this digests blood clots that are important in myocardial infarctions. Uh, if somebody has a, a heart attack, it's usually due to a, uh, to a clot in a coronary artery and you uh, bring in TPA and it goes to the clot and digest it, restoring blood flow, uh, similar to the way the Drano will allow your drain to sink. And then uh, a lot of hormones, of course, the first uh, product was insulin, uh, extraordinarily important, still extraordinarily important. Uh, the next product was human growth hormone. Uh, again, an extraordinarily uh, useful product, uh, but really uh, antibodies uh, and monoclonal antibodies are going to continue to dominate for the next decade. So 
what I'm thinking about a lot now myself is uh, gene therapy and cell therapy and these new emerging components, uh, synthetic biology, uh, but I always have to ground myself that antibodies are going to dominate and continue to dominate uh, for the next decade. So antibodies are going to be the, the major product. Now in uh, cell molecular biology, we talk about the uh, primary structure, the amino acid sequence, and uh, then uh, we talk about um, uh, uh, folding. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, these proteins can have pretty large and pretty complicated um, structures with different domains. This is tissue plasmid engine activator, and it has multiple domains, uh, a finger, uh, growth factor. Uh, these are called Kringles. They had a shape uh, similar to a Danish pastry called a Kringla. And so there are two Kringles. And then uh, here's where the active site uh, sort of centers and the protease is kind of in, in this section. And uh, again, uh, this has to be produced in uh, Cho cells because E. coli just can't, they, they E. coli can't um, fold something this large and, and this complex. And also this has to be glycosylated and uh, only mammalian cells can glycosylate. So here's a point that you make to your students in cell molecular biology, but uh, you have to uh, put a punctuation point on it for uh, biomanufacturing, that the protein folds into a three-dimensional shape. And we talk about secondary structure tertiary structure and quaternary structure, but the function of the protein depends on the shape. And we talk about one of the key principles in biology is uh, structure dictates function, function flows from structure, the relationship of structure and function. You can see this in proteins that everything is their three-dimensional structure. And a corollary of that is if the protein loses its shape, it loses its function. Now for biomanufacturing, what that means is all the way along at every step of the manufacturing process, you have to assure that the conditions surrounding the protein are such that they do not lose their shape because if they lose their shape, then they are entirely worthless to you. This is very, very different than small molecule pharmaceuticals. Small molecule pharmaceuticals, you, you don't have to worry about this consideration. With proteins, you do. You have, you have to worry about the cell folding them properly. And then from then on at every stage of your bioprocessing, you have <clears throat> every unit operation, you have to make sure that you are not unfolding them. And the other thing about protein structure, and again, here's where we depart from maybe your lectures in cell and molecular biology, your, your lectures to your introductory students or even to your advanced students that many proteins, especially serum proteins, uh, have to be glycosylated. They have a carbohydrate covalently bonded to them and they are not really functional if they are not glycosylated. They just do not work. And again, glycosylation has to occur in mammalian cells for now. And uh, therefore, if Glycosylation is important either for solubility or pharmacokinetics, that is the half-life in the blood, then your glycosylation is going to be important. And here's a point, glycosylation patterns may vary. And we'll, we'll talk about that. But what that means now is in cell molecular biology, we think of a protein as kind of a uniform entity that all of the proteins made a uh, coded for by this gene will have the same amino acid sequence. And so we think about every protein in our solution being the same. But what happens is uh, when Genentech produces tissue plasm plasminogen activator, 30% um, has this glycosylation pattern, 25% 20, has this glycosylation pattern, 20% has this glycosylation pattern, 10% is this glycosylation pattern. And so you have really a mixture of proteins uh, in your solution that are, that's going to be injected into the patient. And 
every single time that your CHO cells produce this mixture of proteins and, uh, and transport it to the cell culture solution surrounding it, the media surrounding it, uh, every time that you run a batch, that batch is going to have to end up with the same ratio of glycosylation patterns that you produced in the batch that you took through clinical trials, that you, you, you put through uh, clinical, um, uh, clinical tests. Hey, Jim. Did, I, did I say the proteins and product? Yeah, Rob. So that glycosylation pattern, is that due to the variation in the CHO cells? Or is it just- uh, No, the, the CHO cells uh, glycosylate differently. They have a ratio. Uh, and of course, glycosylation occurs in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, you know, so you have, and, and that, that's coming up, but remember that you have um, programmed or genetically engineered these cells to secrete. What that means is in the gene upstream of your gene of interest, you've put in the, si the signal sequence and that signal sequence is going to be uh, cut off uh, in the end. And uh, it, these cells are going to be made, uh, sorry, the, these proteins are going to be made by ribosomes that are attached to the rough ER and then they are going to be processed in the Golgi uh, end up in secretory vesicles, which then exocytose and and uh, fuse with the plasma membrane. So these are secreted and they are processed. There is a lot of post translational modifications that occur uh, in the Golgi apparatus. Yeah. Okay. okay thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, and again, the protein cannot be denatured, and. Uh, I, I made this point before, but I, I pound this into the students. These products are parenteral. They are going to be injected with one exception I can think of. The exception is pulmozyme. It's a, the Genentech makes a DNA, a, a DNA digesting uh, nuclease that is inhaled. And that is for cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, cystic fibrosis patients have a, a tremendous viscous mucus and a lot of that viscosity is due to uh, DNA being released by lysed cells and so they inhale this enzyme this DNA digesting enzyme it breaks up the uh, the the DNA polymers into nucleotides and um, reduces that viscosity so they that they can cough it out so and that one treatment has changed the life expectancy, the average life expectancy of a cystic fibrosic patient from uh, age seven to age 39. So uh, that's the one ex exception I can think of, but uh, these products are ingested. You cannot have a protein pill because if you take the protein pill, the minute that it hits the, the acid of the stomach, it's going to denature and you have to keep your protein um, in its native conformation throughout the entirety of the manufacturing process. So the protein is the product. And uh, again, my emphasis in graduate school was nucleic acids. But in the end, uh, I remember one guy said, I went into proteins because proteins are going to be important. I thought, oh, uh, years later, I thought, oh, you were smart. I was dumb. Uh, but, but there it is. And again, you have to avoid uh, pH extremes, you have to avoid temperature extremes, you have to avoid organic chemicals, and, and you have to avoid agitation. Now, uh, agitation including uh, pumps, so you have to worry about your pumps that are pumping protein-containing solution from point A to point B, uh, not putting so much pressure on them that uh, they will denature them. And I, I have a point here that students must distinguish between the term denaturation and degradation. And my experience is that they get that wrong. And so I, I have to, uh, I, I, again, I, I have to pound them on that. Uh, does anyone have any comments on how they teach this, the, the importance of proteins maintaining their, their conformation? One thing well, I do, Jim? Yeah, Sandy. Is um, I ask them if they've ever made a, uh, a fried egg, <laughs> yes, uh <-huh>. right? 
you can't unfry it. I mean, yeah, I so, know you can actually uh, now, I think. Yeah, but, yeah. It's a uh, irreversible denaturation versus reversible denaturation yes and, and you, you know one thing talking about the egg um is to have students actually take an egg they know about heat but they are really fascinated when you can do something similar to the egg just by changing the ph by adding acid or base extremes and watching the egg denature because they don't really think of it that way so I, I tell the story that when I go to the fundraisers that are pancake breakfast, I always start with orange juice and uh, there's orange juice in the cup and I, 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 I drink the orange juice and then I move on to milk and I don't want to waste the cup and so I pour the milk into uh, and it curdles because uh, the proteins in the milk denature and that's an example of the, the pH denaturing it. And then of course cheese can be denatured uh, by pH, or pro, milk is denatured to produce cheese by pH changes and, and by the renolase, which uh, <clears throat> chops it, it's protease that chops it, and then uh, they aggregate and, and denature. So all of these have to be avoided. <clears throat> so in biomanufacturing, you always surround your proteins with a buffer. And uh, Buffer prep is probably where they're going to start and you call the solutions buffers. And uh, what's really, really important, and they, they won't remember this coming out of chemistry, but this concept of a buffer where uh, I, I have them do this experiment, uh, take the pH of water and uh, you know it's, it's near neutral and then put one drop of acid in it and the pH drops to uh, pH two with one drop of acid. On the other hand, if you do that with milk, uh, it's about neutral, take one drop of acid and it'll stay you know, neutral and you have to pour in a lot of acid in order to get the pH to drop. And so this idea of a buffered solution and how important that is, every solution that surrounds your protein will be buffered. Uh, likewise, you're, you're going to guard it against temperature extremes. You're probably going to store it at lower, at, at refrigerator temperatures or lower and, and the rest. And so uh, again, you genetically engineer a gene and here we have the central dogma. It makes messenger RNA and the messenger RNA codes for a protein of a particular amino acid sequence, but I don't stop there. And then I go into folding, I go into, three-dimensional structure and the three-dimensional structure is what dictates the function. So this stops prematurely that, remember, you, you have to have those additional steps in order for the protein to mean anything. And again, the importance of eukaryotic cells in folding these hard-to-fold proteins that are compl complex, uh, uh, the interior oxidative reduction characteristics of it are, are different and uh, everything is different. And again, uh, I, I pulled this out of Campbell's textbook, but if you have genetically engineered your protein correctly uh, in mammalian cells, you can get them secreted and you have to, in, at, at the gene level, put in the, the signal sequence. Uh, there's an interesting thing of secretion in E. coli uh, Genentech's first human growth hormone was called protropin, and that was made uh, interior, uh, intracellularly. And uh, if you read the description of protropin, it says it has an extra methionine on the end. Well, it has a formulated methionine because it's E. coli, it's prokaryotic. Uh, so the first protropin had an extra methionine, and they had to prove that that extra methionine did not alter the function of that human growth hormone. Uh, later, neutropin was genetically engineered to be secreted and uh, it, it had the um, uh, beta-lactamase uh, signal protein up front. Now, what secretion means in E. coli is secreted out of the plasma membrane into the paraplasm and then that signal sequence, as that happens, that signal sequence is cut off and it cut off the extra methionine, 
if that makes sense, makes sense. So secretion in E. coli so far is still uh, intracellular, but the protein aggregates in the periplasm rather than in the cytoplasm. Uh, about 1% of it leaks out. There's a lot of motion in that. I, I said before that what we're talking about for the next 10 years, dominating this landscape, dominating biomanufacturing are, are going to be antibodies. And uh, the antibodies, if you have followed this from the beginning, uh, antibodies were gonna be the big thing in the early eighties and all of the stocks uh, for biotech companies went up, 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 and then it, it didn't come and so uh, then the stocks went down, down, down. And, and the reason it didn't come, of course, is that the first monoclonal antibodies were produced in hybridomas made from uh, mouse cells from a fusion of a myeloma and a B cell. And <clears throat> the first antibody products were 100% mouse, which could produce a, an immune response, a HAMA, human anti-mouse antibodies. So you have anti-antibody antibodies. And then uh, the, the genetic engineering of the heavy chain, so you had chimeric, and then ending up humanized and the, uh, where only the hypervariable regions that surround the antigen binding site uh, are mouse, but uh, ultimately uh, human, where you're making humanized mice and injecting them and then uh, a fully human sequence, uh, which will be the next generation of antibodies. Uh, most of the antibodies, the, the legacy antibodies at least are humanized. Yes, xenomouse, yeah, excellent. And uh, so antibodies like a lot of serum proteins are, are glycosylated. And again, they have to be glycosylated properly. And if they're not glycosylated properly, the liver is going to clear them from the blood too quickly for them to be useful. And so we, uh, there are human glycosylation patterns and different patterns, of course, bacteria don't glycosylate. There's a lot of uh, genetic engineering going to try to get bacteria to gly glycosylate to put those in. Uh, yeast gly glycosylate, but the pattern isn't quite right. Insect cells glycosylate, the pattern isn't quite right. Uh, but um, uh, Cho cells will glycosylate in a human-ish pattern. And so those are the cells uh, of choice. And again, the glycosylation patterns will be a variety of glycosylation. And so when you have an antibody, even though the amino acid sequence might be the same antibody to antibody to antibody, you really have a mixture of proteins because you have a variety of glycosylation patterns. And when you undergo production, uh, your product should have the same ratios of glycosylation that you had uh, during the production that, that uh, produced the material that you took through clinical trials and you proved that was safe. Um, an important part of this is thinking about keeping those proteins folded is formulation. And so uh, let me make a distinction between the drug substance and the drug product, DS versus DP. The drug substance, the other name is the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Uh, so that's the antibody or that's the monoclonal antibody. Uh, it is going to be surrounded by a formulation buffer. It's going to be surrounded by a solution that is going to keep it folded and also adjust it to the right osmotic pressure, the osmotic pressure of blood, because this is going to be injected. Uh, so the drug substance will have excipients. Those are, that's a name for molecules other than the protein, molecules other than the drug substance. Uh, so you're gonna have buffer components again to adjust it to the right pH and to keep it at the right pH. Uh, osmotic agents, it's going to be somewhere around uh, 300 millimole, right? Uh, 0.150 sodium chloride, it has to be isotonic with the blood. <clears throat> You're going to have uh, solubility enhancers. Uh, there'll be some molecules in there that will keep the proteins from aggregating uh, to each other and keep the proteins from 
adsorbing to the vial surrounding it. Uh, you may put in preservatives, you may put in antioxidants. And if the protein is going to be freeze dried, if it's going to be lyophilized, it uh, has to have something to protect it uh, from that. So I pulled a uh, description for Herceptin. Now Herceptin is the molecule that Genentech Vacaville was built for. And this is a tremendous antibody in that uh, this solved a real problem. Uh, women that had HER2 positive breast cancer and especially uh, aggressive type of breast cancer uh, didn't last a year because that type of breast cancer was, was so aggressive. Uh, with adding Herceptin to traditional chemotherapy, uh, women are with that type of breast cancer are living beyond the five-year mark, to the five-year mark and, and beyond. And so really this is what Genentech Vacaville was, um, uh, was built for. And what I do at the end of a lecture is I go to the um, drug insert that is required by law to be in every package. And uh, section 11 always has a description of the drug. And I uh, point out to the students how, how uh, smart they become, how this description uh, wouldn't mean much to them uh, at the beginning of the lecture, but now they understand it. So uh, Herceptin is a humanized IgG1 kappa monoclonal antibody. And uh, remember, uh, this refers to the light chain. There are kappa and lambda light chains. And uh, uh, I, 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 rem I, I remind them that you, you didn't know about the different categories of immunoglobulin. You may have not known that immune globulin means antibody at the beginning of lecture, now you do. And that this is IgG as opposed to Ig, uh, IgM, IgA, IgD, and IgE. And so uh, look, look how smart you are. And uh, it has a high affinity to the extracellular domain of the human epider uh, epidermal growth factor receptor two protein, HER2. It's produced by recombinant DNA technology in a mammalian cell, parentheses Chinese hamster ovary cell culture, containing uh, gentamicin. And I don't know why they put that in, but there it is. Herceptin is a white, is a sterile, white to pale, yellow, white to pale yellow, preservative free lyophilized powder for intravenous administration. Each multi-use vial of Herceptin contains 440 milligrams of the enzyme, 400 milligrams of this um, sugar, um, 9.9 .9 milligrams L-histidine uh, hydrochloride, 6.4 milligrams L-histidine, and 1.8 milligrams polysorbate 20 uh, produced under the United States Pharmacopeia method. Reconstitution with um, 20 milliliters of the appropriate dilutant, a bacteriostatic water for dilution or sterile water for dilution for water for injection, bacteriostatic water for injection or sterile water for injection yields a solution containing 21 uh, milligrams per milliliter of the enzyme at a pH of approximately six. And so I have the students uh, initially speculate what these formulation molecules, uh, what these excipients uh, are, are doing. And many, many of them are chosen to do a dual purpose, to serve a dual purpose. And so, especially, and then I, I choose, here is a TPA and L-arginine, phosphoric acid, and polysorbate. And of course, um, we do this in graduate school, right? We have TRIS and TRIS HCL, and you mix a particular ratio. And depending on the ratio, the, the pH pops out. And that, of course, are the buffers here uh, using that um, amino acid as the, as, as the buffer molecule uh, creating the right pH. Uh, this clearly, and uh, it's a large amount, uh, this clearly is for osmotic pressure, uh, plus uh, being a sugar, it is going to help the proteins uh, during the, the lyophilization process. It's a, it's a cryoprotectant as well. Polysorbate is a uh, surfactant that um, will prevent it from adsorbing to the side of the vial. And so you can look at that. And then uh, these 
proteins, again, they're, they're going to go directly into the bloodstream. Don't PASCO, don't collect uh, $100, that these must be sterile, sterile, sterile. You can't inject any bacteria directly into the bloodstream. You don't worry about it so much with a pill because the pill is going to hit the stomach and any bacteria on the pill are, are, are going to be destroyed by the extreme pH of the stomach. This is going directly into the bloodstream of children. And so uh, when you fill the sterile vial, you have to prove the sterile vials are filled, or, or the, the vials are sterile, the stoppers are sterile, the closures are sterile. And uh, of course the, the drug uh, product has to have been fer sterile filtered in order to go in. And uh, these are heavily automated. And uh, if you have a technician, uh, all of the air is going to be filtered and the air is screaming. Uh, you're going to have tremendous air turnover. Uh, the air is moving, uh, not in a turbulent way, but the air is moving in a, a laminar flow. And uh, the, the people are the dirtiest thing that the technicians uh, that are refilling the, the vials are, are the dirtiest thing in there and they have to be triple gowned and not an inch of skin showing. And uh, if you know Jennifer here, uh, here is our, uh, our uh, laboratory manager. Uh, and uh, we went to uh, the BTEC Center in North Carolina and learned how to triple gown like this. Uh, it takes about a half hour. If you get good, you can cut it down to uh, 15 minutes and of course, if you're working in a sterile fill facility, you stop drinking coffee because uh, you don't want to have to exit. And uh, you pay close attention to um, the number of particles in the air. Uh, ISO has them as uh, numbers. Um, the uh, EU has them as letters uh, in kind of an arcane way in the United States. It's number of particles per cubic foot and then that is going out of, uh, out of style. And uh, anyway, I, I put this in for you to see gowning. Uh, if you are freeze drying, and again, if you lyophilize the drug component, uh, it is going to be that much more stable. Uh, it'll have that shelf life and you have to put in uh, the, these uh, excipients or you get this funky lyophilization uh, it really has to be uniform uh, powder and uh, packaged again with water for injection. The physicians don't like this because again, what you have to do is take a hypodermic needle, remove the, the right volume, uh, inject the right volume into the vial, mix it. Uh, it had better not be cloudy, that it, it, it all had better be soluble and you have solub 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 solubility agents uh, in there. And then, uh, then the physician takes and removes enough and injects it directly into the patient. If you had a liquid formulation, it's much more convenient for the physician. If you have a liquid formulation already in a hypodermic needle, it's even more convenient for the physician. And uh, uh, so uh, then you put the closures on. And what I do uh, with my students is uh, I, I have a summer boot camp and I have them uh, grow E. coli that's been genetically engineered to produce green fluorescent protein. Uh, they break the cells open. They put them through filtration and chromatography. Uh, they sterile filter. And in the end, I have them in a biosafety cabinet uh, fill up a vial and put the, the sterile uh, closure on the sterile cap and closure on and label it and they, they go home with a vial of sterile green fluorescent protein. It turns out green fluorescent protein is really stable and so that is going to last them for years and uh, they have a souvenir uh, of the class. Uh, again, uh, lyophilization is important and uh, labeling is important. Uh, you go, uh, when, when you start the run, you go to a safe and you sign out a thousand labels and then you put the labels on the labeling machine and you, let's say that you start with a thousand labels and you label 500 vials, uh, there had damn well better be 500 labels left 
uh, if there are not, you launch this massive investigation. Uh, why didn't the numbers turn out? Where did that extra label go? And so labeling is extraordinarily important. And uh, again, what's interesting about this is uh, then having the biotech companies apply everything that we know about molecular biology uh, to uh, engineering the protein. Uh, you don't really need all of this that's in the natural protein. Uh, maybe get rid of some of it that, that's non-functional. Uh, but uh, this again, this is tissue plasma engine activator, the enzyme that digests blood clots. And if you alter the gene uh, in your production cell uh, and alter uh, a base pair, you're going to, you can uh, alter the amino acid sequence of it. And so this is um, tissue plasminogen activator. And uh, here is the variant, the protein engineered variant of tissue plas plasminogen activator uh, called TNKase. And this has been engineered to have three different changes uh, that are outlined here. Uh, so uh, the, the first change is they added a glycosylation site here and that glycosylation site, the additional glycosylation site changed the half-life of TPA from a minute or two uh, to hours. So the, the native TPA, the TPA that is natural in the human body uh, for the yin and yang of clotting and then digesting the clot, uh, that natural tissue plasminogen activator has a half-life of uh, a minute and a half. This, and so the, the first version of TPA, traditional TPA, you had to perfuse, you had to put it into an IV and drip it in slowly over the course of an hour because if you injected it all in, all of the TPA would be, would be gone uh, in a couple of minutes with the half-life of a minute and a half. It would, would have been cleared by the liver. This altered TPA is, uh, has a half-life of a few hours. So now you, if you are a EMT and someone is having a heart attack, you can inject it in one bolus and it'll circulate around again and again and again uh, going to the clot. And then uh, uh, there is a, uh, a removal of a glycosylation site that sterically hindered this from having a, a full binding to the substrate of this enzyme to the fibrin clot. By removing that, it increased the affinity of that to the clot. And then uh, by putting in uh, some alanines here, uh, it uh, increased the resistant to uh, plasminogen activator inhibitors. And so uh, now, uh, again, it increase the efficiency of this enzyme. And you can do this, and uh, Amgen did this, uh, altered human uh, erythropoietin, it, they altered their EPO, and they altered their uh, granulocyte colony stimulating factor. And the other thing that this does is now, with the new version of your drug, you've reset the, uh, the patent clock. So the old TPA is off patent and therefore open for biosimilars for the generic equivalent of this protein product. Uh, but this is not, you reset the patent clock uh, with this new version of uh, TPA. And so uh, this is exciting. Again, don't take what evolution gave you, uh, improve on nature uh, with our knowledge of cell and molecular biology. Okay, and, th and from there, I'll, I'll open it up uh, to discussion and uh, see what everyone has to say. Let me ask you uh, again, uh, how do you teach protein? Because you do that in every biology class. So. Uh, Jim, it's Daisy from Texas. Oh yeah, hi Daisy. Hi, um, I have a um, quick question for you. So would you agree that um, if we we produce like one year certificate, the students from the program has to be really, really solid on lab calculation and how to make a very complicated, we're not talking about simple buffer, but complicated buffer by using all the 
dilution, molarity, you know, pH adjustment, volume adjustment. Would you agree with me on that? Yeah, I, I think so. And uh, I, I tell them, mm -hmm. uh, look, it, it sounds like a mundane oh, thing. No, I opened. This, uh, but this is a marketable skill, right? If you can make a buffer, you can get hired. And uh, more Same. than that, uh, what we have is, and uh, nationwide, we were talking about having a lower level um, certificate called the lab assistant, and then talking about to, uh, calling our associate's degree with all of the classes lab technician. And I, I think the lab assistant, Daisy, that, that's where you really pound that. You, you, you have to be able to make a buffer. You have to make, be able to make a, a fairly complicated buffer. I, I agree with you entirely. And then from a lab assistant, you can get a job. And, but you're not going to be operating a bioreactor. You're going to be making buffers. You're going to be making media. And, and that is a marketable skill. But it's a, it's a must have skill if they want to find a job so. in. Yeah, must yeah. have. Okay. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> essential. Yeah. So for your protein teaching question, I think I was going to, I'm sorry, shipping one, um, one thing I do. Whenever um, I teach protein, the, <clears throat> One of the things I found is actually, I'm not a big fan of everything from BioRed, but one of the things they have is that um, biofuel enzyme kit. I, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of people in this chat room used it. And they do, um, they do a good job. They do a good job to, uh, to, to make different version of experiment repeated by- Which the, enzyme is it? It's a biofuel on the cellular bias. Yeah, that, that yeah. and then you, the student got a chance to extract the yeah. cellular bias from the mushroom. And then uh, they, you can repeat it by uh, changing the you know, substrate, changing the pH, changing uh, everything. So I think that's a good practice if you really want a student to know, okay, if you want to keep this protein alive, this is what you have to, you have to worry about, the, you know, temperature, pH, the salt concentration. I think that's uh, one of the things I found is helpful for my students when they learn how to keep this uh, protein alive. Right, right. A anyone else have? Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, for this semester of uh, the GC fourteen fifteen, we uh, teach students about protein, and actually, they should take it all the process. We work on GFP protein; that's mm -hmm. our main uh, protein that we worked on. As uh, more dedicated, like about five six labs to it. It's all the process from lysing back uh, E. coli cells for the protein extractions, uh, salting out, preparing buffers, column. And we also run it, all the preparation step of uh, dialysis when we come ready for the analysis. So we even run it on the uh, FPLC uh, before the analysis preparation FPLC. And then, you know, uh, the absorption of protein, fluorescence, and also uh, we do the uh, SDS page. So actually, they learn a lot how to the, all the uh, keep good condition from good buffer how to maintain the protein, try to keep the protein structure and how to do analysis for it. So actually this lab, they teach a lot, you know, they learn about a lot of skills relating how to prepare this protein for analysis. I think a lot of people uh, use green fluorescent protein. I, I think it's a good first protein. I'm, I'm always worried though, aren't you, that the students get the wrong idea that proteins have a color you know, no, have a color, no definitely. Green, right? We just tell them this yeah, is yeah. an example. It's interesting because interesting because besides doing the absorption, all the other analysis, they could apply the UV light. You know, like visually, they can see it. But we always let them know not all these techniques apply for all proteins. Good. One thing I do is I, I give them a, a take home worksheet and I during COVID, I gave it as a test, and I give them the amino acid sequence for the first protein that was produced, somatostatin. It's 14 amino acids long, and I ask them, okay, what's the, what's the possible messenger RNA sequence? What's the possible DNA sequence? Okay, here's a codon preference chart. If you're going to put it into E. coli, what are your codon choices out of the redundancy? If you're going to put it in humans, what are your co codon choices? Um, so, you know, co codon op optimization for the, uh, for the 
particular organism. And then I, I, I ask him, did you forget a start cone on? <laughs> okay, what do you need upstream? Did you forget a promoter? Did you forget a ribosome binding site? Did you forget a termination of transcription signal, which is different than the stop codon and no one knows that. <laughs> uh, what, what do you need to secrete it? Okay, did you, uh, did you, uh, did you put a signal sequence up front? And, and so I, I thought that's a pretty interesting, it turns out to be an interesting exercise uh, for them. Uh, yeah, but green forest protein. Anyone else uh, have weigh in on this? I have a um, question. Can I, Jim, can I just interrupt just a second? Okay. So I just want to let everybody know that our next session will be in 10 minutes. And if you want to discuss further, you can take a break or continue discussion. But in about 10 minutes, we'll be starting our next session with uh, Joseph Kirkpatrick. Uh, but if you want to continue discussion, the break is also a discussion. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Bernie. Good. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that's what everyone wanted. <laughs> <laughs> It was one of those. Hey, Jim, talk about protein. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. This is fantastic. So much, uh, so much information. Thank you so much. I have a question for you, Jim. Yeah. I was wondering. Antibodies. If... What? Antibodies. Well, that's not a question. That's a <laughs> how, how fantastic um, they are. You wrote an entire grant on antibodies. We'll talk more about antibodies. Um, no, my question was actually about, and I, I'm, blanking on the name of this enzyme, but there's an enzyme that makes cats brown and you can mutate it and get temperature sensitive cats, you know, Siamese cats, right? And I believe I can make models that show what happens when you raise the temperature structure models. I was wondering, would that be useful to you? That is interesting. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, but I, I think you need to do it in bacteria, right? You have different colors of bacteria and have them have a different color at one temperature than another. Something mm -hmm. like that, you know? Then yeah, could probably do that. I was just yeah. thinking something you could do with molecular modeling. Yeah, yeah, that's neat. Yeah, so uh, uh, one thing I have, I've, I've been having my students do is uh, Petri dish art mm. to work on their, uh, uh, their uh, aseptic technique. The other thing is our, our very first experiment, uh, every single class I teach has, has the same first experiment. You, uh, I, I hand them, uh, Sierra Nevada, uh, which is bottle conditioned and has live yeast on the bottom. And I have them uh, take, uh, sterilely transfer a milliliter into a broth culture. And then we incubate that. And then the next is a four quadrant streak onto a Petri dish. And uh, it's kind of a fun way to have them start with aseptic technique. But. Uh, Sandy, antibodies. Yeah. <laughs> Bi specific antibodies and catalytic antibodies and. Antibodies okay. and uh, camel yeah. bodies. <laughs> yeah, camel, camel, camelid antibodies. Yeah. Yama antibodies. They also have mutations that can extend the half life, apparently. I've been learning about. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Bites, yeah, fantastic, yeah. Uh -huh. oh, those are amazing. Yeah, the new, um, the chromatography columns for um, adenal associated virus. So when you're making anal uh, adenal associated virus, the chromatography columns have anti-AAV camelid antibodies. That, that's how they get the affinity out. Yeah, so 